welcome in to another humankind video here on the YouTube channel. And we're going to do something a little different today. Back in March of 2022, nearly a year and a half ago, I came out with a build order video for humankind. It is linked in the description below. If you want to check out my original thoughts, it's going to go in. That one goes into a little more detail than this one probably will on my thoughts on build order and humankind. However, across the year and a half since that video has come out, uh, as we approach the two-year anniversary of Humankind coming up in mid-August, I wanted to go back and revisit some of my thoughts on build order in Humankind. This might provide some of you with a moment of, uh, I told you so, potentially, uh, and I'm okay with that, because that is what uh, gaming is all about, that's especially what 4X gaming is all about, is constantly learning, iterating on your strategies, figuring out what the best thing to do is. Um, I have altered some of my strategies around things uh, that, that I've been taught by the community, uh, both here on YouTube, also over on the live streams at uh, twitch.tv uh, slash maddishmoose, and so... Throughout the course of that time, I've altered some of my strategies. So what I'd like to do today is walk you through kind of some of my new thoughts as well as some of my old thoughts. So it'll be a mix of, of both ideas uh, from both early game build order, mid game build order and late game build order. So we're going to pull up uh, a game that you'll if you're on the YouTube channel, you may be familiar with. It's uh, I'm pulling up different save files from uh, our Let's Play series. So if you want to check out the Let's Play and see all the things that happen in between all the things we're about to pull up. You could jump in and check out that original Let's Play series on the channel as well. But let's jump in and we'll talk early game build order first, work our way to mid, and then late game. Let's jump into let's jump into some humankind. Okay. So again, you might recognize uh this particular capital city, uh Corral. We used this in our Let's Play series that we did originally on the YouTube channel. Uh, I think that was well, it was a while ago now. It was a while ago now, but it was a really fun let's play. And we're going to talk build order from some save files from this particular game. Our early game file uh, is this one. So this is turn 27s. So we're very early in the game. We only have one city. Uh, and so a lot of what I'm going to say in this particular uh, part for early game build is in regards to first city, second city, maybe even third city. Um, everything changes a little bit uh, in build order when you get into different technologies. The first technology that really alters your build order coming uh, here at feudalism in the medieval era. So once you get to colony model and you unlock all of the infrastructures that existed in the ancient and classical, they're automatically added to your cities. Once you get to this point, your build order decisions are going to change because you're going to lean heavily towards districts and you're going to lean away from infrastructures in any city that you start after you research feudalism. But prior to that is what I would call, in humankind anyway, early game uh, bu building. So er our early game build order really focuses on kind of pre-feudalism. Um, so we're talking classical era, we're talking ancient era as far as technologies and kind of where you're at in the game. So everyone will know if you're familiar with my style, if you've been both on YouTube or Twitch, um, I have been very high on animal barns for quite some time. The game, uh, the game has really changed in the sense that animal barns haven't changed at all. None of the texts around animal barns have changed. Uh, basically, I was uh, just hooked on them, and they're not the best first build. Uh, they're a good build, and I'll explain when we should probably build them. But when we're talking early game builds, uh, and one of the things that came out since uh, the since my original video was the fact that you can now direct compare things, right? So we can see. Uh, that the granary is going to get us uh, plus eight food. We can see that the animal barns is going to get us plus five food. Uh, that was not in existence when I created the video, right? You had to do your own math. And the math always seemed quite easy to just do animal barns because you just saw that plus five food for horses. So if you had horses, y you might just assume to put it in. The other benefit is you know you're going to get more horses because you're probably going to put more horses in or trade for more horses. And so then horses are very valuable. So... Are animal barns the best opening build? Uh, the answer to that question is undoubtedly no. Um, and why that is, is because you're only ever going to have access to one horse at the beginning of the game for the most part. You might end up with two in territories, but
But here's here here comes the problem, and this is what kind of what I learned and what was pointed out to me is that in order to get uh, animal barns and even access to horses, you have to re research domestication, which is fine because in order to get access to the granary, which is going to be our substitute building, you have to research calendar. The difference is you get artisan's quarters with calendar, right, which are arguably one of the more powerful things in the game, uh, whereas you just get horses which go into animal barns uh, when you research domestication. So not only do you have to research a tech, you then have to do a double build. And the double build is, I think, what really causes this to lose its value early on in the game. You have to not only build in your horses, right? So you have to build in your 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 uh, horse ranch, right? Your actual exploit exploitation of the horses themselves. But then you also then have to build in your animal barns. And so that becomes problematic because you're now building horses, which the gains are very little, right? Like the gains here, if you can look at it right now, plus one food from exploitation, plus two science from exploitation. It's a one food, two science pile. It's not great. Although the early science is potentially beneficial because two science early game is pretty big. So I wouldn't necessarily delay getting horses and the science is potentially powerful. But as far as food gains are concerned, which is usually the first thing I'm concerned about, particularly in early game, but throughout the game of humankind, if you have to build in horses and then you have to build in the animal barns, that creates a double build off of a, off of a research. Whereas if you just go granary as your first build, uh, or it's actually your second build, right? Because you're going to put pottery barns in first, uh, or sorry, what's the, what's the, what's it called? You're going to put the, the initial, the initial influence one in first. That's the first, that's the first build you want to put in, right? Uh, but for a second build, you're looking to go food, right? And so you could put a, a, you could put a district in, you could do that. And a farmer's quarter is going to be an important early game build as we start to get into kind of the, the territory of kind of uh, early game. It's, you're going to be building quarters, obviously in early game before mid game, but Infrastructures don't cost you that initial stability, and so they allow you to keep your stability under control while still increasing that cap. And so a lot of the times an infrastructure, a food infrastructure first is where I'm going to go, uh, and then and then we'll start going into districts. So granary gets you a couple of important things. Number one, uh, it gets you plus two food per farmer. That's inherently going to be good, because if you if you follow my, my, build, my, uh, my worker order guide... Um, I always will stack food workers uh, every time, uh, except for the second worker. I always put my second worker in industry. First worker goes food, second worker goes industry. After that, fill food, then industry. That's basically how I play almost all games of humankind. And there's variants that I've heard that are that are really good as well. People playing completely differently than that. Uh, awesome, great. Uh, more power too. That's the beauty of humankind is that is that you can kind of play however you want and figure out within that what works, right? Which is exciting. For me, because I'm always putting in multiple people into my worker slots, that gets me plus two for plus two food per farmer. So I'm getting plus two food for every worker in one of those slots, which is going to get me a lot of food. The other thing it gets me is an additional farmer slot. So right away, it increases my pop cap and allows me to put more workers into food. The granary is particularly important early game if you plan on uh, putting any of your population back into your city. So you, you have scouts all over the place from the Neolithic era, potentially. If you've gotten too many of them in the Neolithic, which is actually pretty common, and you want to put them back into your city to A, maybe turn them into warriors or turn them into a more powerful military unit, or just put them back into your city to try to boost up that city early on from a population standpoint and give it more workers... The granary is a much better play because it gives you an extra farmer slot right away. So if you're disbanding units back into your cities, you can disband them into farmer slots, which is going to push the food while still increasing your population because you're disbanding into it. Then the food requirements go up because you're disbanding into it, but you're going to put them into a farmer slot because of the granary, hence allowing you to continue to grow your city in a pretty rapid fashion. So... Again, I've changed my tune, uh, granary over animal barns. Now, that being said, don't neglect your animal barns, particularly once you have access to a couple of horses, right? We only have access to one horse here, and I don't think we had access. We, we ended up we ended up getting some more later in the game. Obviously, we had some free people stuff happen here. Uh, so we got more horses, and we started trading for horses. That's the other thing to pay attention to, because you can get a lot of horses eventually through trade, if you have good trade relationships. 
that then makes the animal barn very much worth it. Now, the other thing that the animal barn does is it gives you plus one food per farmer's quarter um, and plus one food on farmer's quarter per adjacent farmer's quarter. So if you have adjacency, then you're actually getting plus two food. So all that to say, animal barn should wait until you have farmer's quarters in because then they're more valuable. You should have a farmer's quarter placed, probably have two farmer's quarters placed adjacent to one another in order to maximize animal barns. You could build them beforehand, but you're not getting the gains. You might as well get those districts in first. So uh, I've changed my tune on animal barns. Uh, probably they're they're like a third or fourth order build. Uh, you want to get your granary in first. You're going to want to get your pottery barns in first. You're going to want to get your... Uh, your food district in first. You're gonna get your district in uh, off the bat, your farmer's quarter, and then animal barns is probably gonna come into play at some point uh, after that, right? So early game builds, uh, I do like to focus. Uh, I do like to focus infrastructures uh, until you get access to things like the public fountain, because early game, as you start to expand your city and you start to get attachments in, like we have two attached here already, so we're starting to notice that stability is coming into play. Once we have access to public fountain, we can quickly solve that. Um, and we don't have access to trade right now, right? We haven't discovered a lot of different people to trade with, so our luxury resource uh, is down, and the more luxury resources we trade for, the higher our stability is. So we do have to focus stability a little bit, and that that's why I tend to focus infrastructures early game. We do want to get a couple districts in, and we want to kind of be at least have one or two districts in, particularly of the farmer's quarters, and then definitely for your emblematics. Uh, but early game, I focus infrastructure until we get a good handle on stability, you also want to look at value, right? Uh, so putting in right now an eight food uh, farmer's quarter gets us eight food, but we can also, that's a six turn build, right? For eight food, plus we lose stability. We could just put the granary in, we get the same amount of food, plus we get an additional farmer slot, which is then going to get us plus two, which was going to get us more food, right? Additional food on top of that. Uh, and it costs less and doesn't cost us stability. So Granary becomes a really important play early game. Those are my thoughts on early game builds. As you're working through early game, uh, keeping that growth factor up really high is important. So I always would be looking at that. Uh, you don't want to neglect other things though, right? Pay attention to your stability infrastructures. And if your stability is good, definitely start reaching into those districts, right? Number one, you want to get your emblematics in. Depending on who you're playing, that's going to be really important. You want to make sure you have enough farmer's quarters to be growing your city and not uh, avoiding kind of population cap problems. Uh, and then, of course, I like in any city, I always suggest, and, and at the beginning and into mid-game, always have at least one of every uh, quarter in. So your maker's quarter, your market quarter, your uh, your harbor, your, uh, far your farmer's quarter, as well as your research quarter once you get there, right? As soon as you get access to each of your quarters, always make sure each of your cities has at least one of those because it restricts your access to some powerful infrastructures if you don't, right? So that's another thing to focus on in through like kind of late early game is make sure that you're also getting your districts in at least one of each so that it unlocks the ability to get those different infrastructures that are important to the builds of your city. Uh, that's kind of, that. that is, those are my early game thoughts. What I'm gonna do is pull up another save game now uh, from deeper into the game. We'll go kind of mid game and then talk kind of mid-game build strategy and then work our way into late game. See it in just a second. Okay, here we are deep in mid-game or what I would call mid-game territory for humankind. We're on turn 95. We're at the very end of the medieval era. So we're kind of like right in the middle of mid-game in my opinion. So again, if we go to the tech tree, I use this to kind of determine where am I sitting in the game? Uh, if we're sitting in the medieval or early modern era, that for me signifies like we're mid-game territory. Uh, once we get into the industrial era and of course the contemporary era, that I consider kind of end game. Nah, there's probably parts of the industrial that are still mid-game-esque, but you're really starting to progress towards end game at that point. Uh, so if you're in the medieval uh, or early modern, I would dub that kind of mid-game humankind. Uh, again, there are certain texts that we're keying off of. Obviously, we're about to run out of stuff and probably have to need to move up at this particular point in this game. But as you can, can remember, we talked about feudalism. So we got feudalism. So all the cities we put in after that started with those infrastructures and that changes our build order a little bit. You'll notice we're about to get three-masted ship once we move up and that unlocks all of the 
the infrastructure is from the medieval era as well. So that's another one to, to key off of as far as build order is concerned. Tying that into the tech tree is important. Obviously, you unlock different builds through the tech tree as well. So you want to pay attention to those things. However, Colony Plan gives you those infrastructures. So that's kind of a build order kind of got to pinpoint that as like, okay, so if we get to three bastard ship, that if we're putting in any additional cities, we want to get here first before we do that, because that, that will avoid us having to build all of those infrastructures. It's actually a huge thing. It is massive for a city to start with all those infrastructures and not have to, to build all of them. So pay attention to those key uh, key blueprint ones, the colony plan. Uh, there's another one as we get over here uh, into steam engine, the colony blueprint. So each of those that comes out, uh, make sure that you've got those uh, teched up uh, in your tree and preparing uh, if you're about to put a city in, right? Uh, make sure you got that going on. So let's talk mid-game build considerations. Typically, what is going to happen in the mid-game of humankind is you're going to start to, enc to encounter food problems, right? If you've watched my previous video, you know that I run through kind of a sequence in my mind, right? I run through a sequence of what am I looking at when I'm choosing a build for my city? And one of the first things I look at is uh, food. Where's my food at? We're down to 10 uh, excess food here, 10 food per turn, which is definitely going to create a problem because in two turns right here, we're going to get another population. And I'm already working all my food slots, okay? And so I'm not going to, It's that's going to be a straight drain on food. That's going to dip me below my my food uh, cap, right? So all of a sudden, this, this city will enter a starving status if I'm not building something that is food related to boost my food. Hence, the reason why we're putting a farmer's quarter in here, because we know that this number for food is very low. So we're going to, that's one of the first things I look at. Can I keep my city in growth mode, right? And so we know here that we're in growth mode. The other thing that you want to check, of course, is your population cap. We are above pop cap. And that, again, is another mid-game problem it, you, you will run into in humankind. That's because you haven't quite run into all of the text to be able to get things fixed. Hamlets are a big one, right? To drop, you want to prioritize hamlets in your build order if you're getting to that point in the game because that helps drop that population cap. So not only are we at, we're above pop caps, so we have workers that are not doing anything, we're also suffering from that overpopulation penalty. So we're actually losing, not only from consumption are we losing food, but we're also suffering from that overpopulation penalty. So we're losing additional food on that. So best way to deal with that is building districts, right? Because our farmer's quarter will increase our, uh, our slots, right? We increase our population cap. We also increase the number of farmers that we have to, to work if we're moving people into those slots. You can also look for infrastructures that include that. We don't have any available to us currently uh, here, but there are different infrastructures where you will see that you get plus slots. Uh, so the manuscript Atelier is one of those. You can see listed under effects there, it says not only do you get plus one science per researcher, you also get plus two researcher slots. So it doesn't always have to be a district that you use to alleviate your population cap pressure. You can find those infra those infrastructures. They're more rare, but you can find them. Don't underestimate the value of those infrastructures that have the plus slots. They Because plus two slots, you'd have to build two research quarters to get plus two research slots, right? You'd have to build two farmer's quarters or a farmer's quarter and a research quarter to get the same value out of that. This is a two-turn build right now. That's a two-turn build to free up two population cap that we could be using for, for the workers that are in our city, as opposed to a four turn build to get one, right? So pay attention to your infrastructures, even if the bonus isn't that great. Like we might not be getting that much science off of this. We're actually getting 12, which is not terrible. Um, but those slots become very important, especially if you're near or above that population cap. This becomes less of a problem when you hit end game because certain technologies you research really help uh, alleviate that. And you've probably started to build enough districts that you're not going to be at a pop cap problem necessarily, depending on how you're playing. Um, so something to pay attention to, though. Make sure you watch that population. The other thing to be aware of, and this is probably more important early mid game or late early game, if that makes sense, uh, is stability, right? So we're looking at stability. We have a 10% surplus right now. That's the other thing that came out uh, over the course of the last year and a half within humankind is they added that indicator for surplus. So now you can not only see that you're at 100%, we're actually, we're at 110%. We have a 10% surplus. So if we put in 
a district that de decreases our stability by 10%, we're still going to be at 100%. So we can actually run that math now without having to run the math. Uh, they're doing most of the work for us, which is which is really, really handy. So we're good on stability here, hence the reason why we're building a farmer's quarter, uh, because we don't have any infrastructures that are going to get us those slots, uh, and we need some additional food in this city pretty quickly, right? If we go through and look at some of our other cities, we can start running through that in our head still, right? Food, we're looking good in this city. However, uh, we've got a slight stability issue. I'm, I have no problem with 86. I'd love it to be above 90 because that gives me the best bet for getting good events happening in that city, which is what I want. But we don't have to have more stability and we're approaching pop cap here, right? We're at 37 of 39, so we're getting close. So building something like a scriptorium is definitely going to get us uh, benefits there, right? So uh, paying attention to that, we actually have access to Hamlet, so we can probably solve our problem here pretty quickly. Again, if you're at population cap, Hamlets are a really important build. Hamlets additionally are a great build regardless, because they usually net you some really nice resources. Like if you look over here, these numbers are not great, but they are on river. So you get food and industry on a Hamlet, and so you can kind of pick and choose what you need. Plus, it frees up that population cap spot. Uh, four. You get four spots, right? One of each when you build a hamlet. So that's a really potent method for dealing with that population cap problem. So again, as I'm looking at any of my different cities, is it growing? I'm going to check food. What's the stability like? Do we need to focus on building something that's stability heavy? Because if so, we might come in, we might build a garrison. Uh, if so, we might come in. If we haven't, right, we might build something like an apothecary. Uh, if we need to, right? So any of those uh, buildings, districts, or infrastructures, districts, typically it's only going to be your garrison and your common quarter. I think garrisons are much better than common quarters, so that's what I would go with. Uh, but any of your infrastructures that deal with stability as well can become powerful for helping to deal with that problem uh, because most of the districts you're going to build are going to increase your stability problems. And so if you're looking for, well, I need food, which we don't in this city, but if we needed food and we needed stability... An infrastructure is your best response. You get into a sticky problem if you have population cap problems and you have stability problems and you have food problems. If all three of those things pop up, which is almost true in our capital city at this point, right? Like we're almost in a, a sticky pickle here. The one thing we have going for us is we have, we don't have any stability issues here right now, but we're over pop cap, low on food and our stability is thankfully good because otherwise we would have to be kind of making some decisions about probably buying out some units to decrease our population in that city. That's one way to solve that problem, right? And that actually kind of goes into kind of the, the theory of build order. When are you building your troops? Depends on how aggressive you're being. If you're, if you're at war, you're building troops, right? You're substituting all of this that I'm saying and you're building troops. One of the ways to, to get an army out there without necessarily focusing on building it is just to buy it out when you need to. I like to keep a reserve of gold if, if just in case that's true, right? So if we were to buy out, for example, right now, a unit, it would solve some of our problems, right? Our pop cap would go down because we're removing population from the city. Our food requirements would go down because we're removing that from the city. So if we come down and let's just say we build, let's build our, our special unit. So if we purchase one of these, right? Right away, now we're down at pop cap, so we're no longer getting that overpopulation uh, problem, and our food has skyrocketed, and so we're gonna the city's gonna grow really quickly. This is another one of the things that I feel like is a difference that I've learned in this game. I used to focus really hard on just building anything that was not a unit. I really like keeping a reserve of gold on hand now, just to buy out units in cities that are in trouble. Because you're you're gonna make use of that military at some point, whether it's just a standing army, whether it's something you're gonna go attack a free peoples with, or something, you're gonna make use of that army. The other thing is, with recent changes to humankind, if you don't have an army, the AI will not negotiate with you as far as diplomacy is concerned, and so putting building armies and having a standing army into your build order, like, rapport, like, into your plan, is a good idea. I tend to like to just keep that gold on hand to buy out a unit or do a quick build. You could take a couple turns to build a unit. Usually you want that fixed pretty fast, but you can see how quickly we turned the city around just by buying a unit, right? And again, if, if in the future we're like, I don't need that unit, we can just disband it back into the city. That's always an option, right? Uh, but that's another really potent way of dealing with some of those issues as you're going through kind of the three things that I look at. Um, check those things out. Always keep in mind, especially in mid-game, uh, 
when are you when are you going to move up? So in this particular game, we ran into this problem where we don't have all our scriptoriums in, and we need to move up real badly, right? We're about to hit our our limit, right? We can't re we can't research past uh, into into that area, right? So we're kind of at a point where we need to go beyond, right? We only have one tech left, and we're going to hit that that line, which is not great. We don't want to be burning science every turn. So as you're thinking about your build order, be thinking about how close you are to moving up because that will change how you're kind of like looking at your build order because we need to get our, our emblematic districts in if we indeed want to move up or we're going to miss out on building those emblematics, right? Because if you don't at least put a turn into each uh, into your emblematic districts, you can't build them again. Right, once you move up. So if you want your emblematics in each of your territories, you gotta make sure that you're getting those in in a timely fashion. So work them into your build order in a sustainable way. Those are a lot of the problems and issues that you'll come up with and 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 see in in uh, in the in the mid game. Now there's other things to think about before I jump into late game uh, that I want to quickly bring up. Number number one, wonders. Where do wonders fit into your build order? And this is more of a, uh, it's not a build order strategy in my mind. This is an influence priority strategy. Where are wonders fitting in your strat? When you, when you get a wonder, if you've spent the influence to claim it, unless your cities are in dire need of something, my suggestion is build the wonder. The wonder is going to get you, you're picking that wonder for a reason, right? You're getting some sort of really big benefit off of that wonder. So build it. Don't let it sit unless it's not going to do much for you at the time or your cities are in really big food trouble or stability problems or though the, if they're in stability problems then fix it with the wonder. The wonder will fix at least one of your cities. Um, so those are things to think about from a build order standpoint but really because you have to claim that wonder with influence it's all about do you have the influence to do it. Early game it's very difficult to argue for claiming wonders. Uh, there's some great wonders early game but man influence is, is a, a pretty petty you have lots of things you're trying to do with your influence. Mid-game, you've got a little more flexibility there, so make sure you're prioritizing wonders that might mesh well with your strategy that you're doing, mesh well with the kingdom you're building, with the land that you have even, uh, and and then build those, right? But if you claim them, you're probably claiming them because they're worth building, so probably put some turns from all of your cities into them. That's typically what I do, is I'm not going to just put a couple cities on it. If there's a couple cities that need some help, I might leave them building, you know, whatever they're building from a stability or a food, you know, problem. But for the most part, if I'm claiming a wonder, like, just get it out there, right? Get it built so that you're getting those benefits as soon as possible. The other thing to think about, and I actually don't even think they're in this game, uh, so it's a bad example, uh, is embassies, right? Embassies are, again, another thing that came out since my last build order video. Embassies you can get pretty early, and in fact, you shouldn't even be considering embassies early game. Embassies are more of a uh, mid game. You should be considering them more in the early game. E embassies early is definitely something that you might want to consider. It gives you access to a bunch of really powerful treaties uh, as far as being able to make different deals with, uh, with different members of the world, right, uh, of different em empires. And so that is something to think about is where do you prioritize your embassy? If you're got if you get cities that are in a pretty good spot for a, like you're like ah this city's got like six or so turns however long it takes that city to build an embassy I'd get that embassy in pretty early it's a single build you only have to build it the one time and then you get access to some valuable treaties and things that you might want so early game probably be thinking about putting in that embassy as well and the last thing to be thinking about from early game into mid game is holy sites. So a lot of controversy around religion and faith and humankind, and I could go on a tangent talking about how I think that that needs to be changed, but I'm going to save that for a future video because I did actually just recently play a game where we made every decision based on religion and faith, and the uh, the, the outcome was uh, probably predictable, but also very interesting, so I'll talk about it then. But if you want to be running a religion in this game and getting access to tenants and doing the things that a religion gets you access to, being able to pick these really powerful tenants, you'll notice by turn 95, I have all of my tenants. All of my tenants uh, I have, right? Every single one. You've got all your tenants in already. That's how you really want to play religion and humankind. Get your tenants early and then you can just neglect faith after that. Your tenants are going to get you some really nice things and you could put together something that will benefit you. The other option is just don't do anything with it. I've heard that as a recent strat. 
Um, and so that's something to think about as well. Where do you prioritize religion? Are you going to go after certain tenants that are really going to help you based on the land you find yourself in? Um, and, and that sort of thing. So that can be something to think about from a holy site standpoint. Are you putting those holy sites in? Uh, where do you prioritize them in your build? Um, if you're having stability problems, holy sites are a great way to solve stability issues uh, in a particular city, right? Uh, so make sure you're building it in the right city to be able to take advantage of the stability bonuses, but holy sites can be helpful for that. In addition, obviously, to your, to your religion spread, getting you access to more of those tenants if you have more followers from your religion. Those are my mid-game to early-game thoughts. Let's jump into some late-game thoughts. This one will be a, a shorter segment, uh, but I want to take you into end-game and walk you through some things that you might want to be thinking about. All right, we have catapulted forward in time to late game humankind. We're on turn 159. We've just moved up into the contemporary era. So again, we're kind of smack dab in the middle of what I would consider end game humankind, although we're pretty far into it at this point. We cross through the industrial. We are now in the contemporary era. That is the final era uh, of humankind. And you're really progressing towards your end game condition now, right? How are you going to choose to end the game? Now, if you're winning the game of humankind, which we are, uh, then you're going to progress towards probably the fastest endgame condition you can find because you don't need fame and you don't want to give anyone the opportunity to catch up to you in fame and, and win the game. So typically that means that you're going to gun for rocket science and you're going to go after your space station projects. That's going to be your fastest endgame condition almost every time in, in the game. Uh, that's going to be your, your game ender is going to be that one. That creates a different kind of subset of build order thoughts when you get into, especially as you get into the contemporary era. Number one, you're going to want to be focusing on those projects. Once you get access to those projects, all of your cities should be on them right away because they do take quite a bit of industry to build. So once you get access to the projects, put all of your cities on them because you want to get them done as quickly as possible because those projects combo into projects, combo into projects, right? I think there's a three, it's a three step process to get to that space race end game condition. Some of the other end game conditions might switch up some of your strategies, but for the most part, uh, th these are the thoughts that I have on this. So the first thing you're going to want to focus as you're in end game, and that starts even before the contemporary, right? You're going to want to think about this during the industrial era as well. There are two key things that are gonna get you to your end game condition faster in humankind. That's gonna be research and production. Those two things are going to get you a faster win, are gonna get you to the end of a game quicker, and gonna provide a ton of fame bonuses throughout the rest of the game. So you'll notice we have a lot of science, uh, but we have a lot of stuff to research. Just to get to rocket science, we've got to research three different things. We're going at two turns first. Like we're going really fast, right? But there are a lot of techs that will increase your fame, especially if you get into the end of the tech tree. You've got fame gains just for researching things, and there are some huge bonuses to different technologies throughout the contemporary era that A, if you're behind, can help you catch up. And B, if you're winning, can ensure that you stay ahead and or progress you to an endgame condition. If you're going for a research endgame condition where you research all the techs, research is going to become king. Because we're most of the time, I feel like most players play for the space race endgame condition for, for, for to end the game. You're probably going to want the combo of research and industry. Industry because you want to get your space stations built as quickly as possible. Science or research because you're going to want to get your science up as high as possible to get through the tech tree as quickly as you can to the techs that you need, which are access to the projects, access to aluminum, access to uranium. All of those things become important contributors to what you're doing. So uh, that is why uh, we're playing the Japanese in this particular one. Uh, I think the Japanese are one of the best cultures in the contemporary era. Why? They have the robotics lab, which gets you industry and science as you're progressing through late game humankind so industrial era on be thinking about how am i maximizing my research so that when i get to that final era i can get quickly to the text i need to finish that end game condition or to, to exercise my catch up how am i going to catch up through fame gains if by researching those texts because that's the best way to do it and how am i optimizing my my makers my makers quarters my industry do start to pay attention to pollution, right? You've got a lot of great builds that you could potentially make, but that might increase pollution, right? Here's 12 pollution, but we get 232 industry. 
this would be a fantastic build for this particular city. Why? Let's see. We're near PopCap, but we're not there yet, so we have some time to play with. We've got tons of food, and that's because we executed a completely different kind of wonder-based strategy in this game, so I won't go into that. You could watch the Let's Play if you want to see it. And we don't have any stability problems, right? In fact, we're, we're doing plenty good on stability. So that says, let's build an infrastructure. And since we are in that kind of we need industry and science kind of realm of late game, probably the sawmill is going to be a great idea. And be aware that when you push your pollution past that 20 and go from very low to low pollution, you start to incur pretty significant penalties on each of your cities. If you're going for a pollution endgame condition, which I have heard takes an enormous amount of time, I have never actually attempted that, um, then maybe you're going to go with those penalties. It does penalize your cities pretty heavily, so it actually it, it, it produces a lot of different fims and, and makes it much more difficult to grow those cities and do just general things in those cities. Are you going to produce a lot? Absolutely, your, your industry is going to shoot through the roof, but watch those pollution numbers. If you don't care about it, great, but if you want to optimize those cities, I like to keep it in the very low level. There's a lot of techs in this era that will allow you to do that as well, uh, but this city probably, we're going to pick Sawmill here, right, uh, as our build. We also want to make sure we get our robotics labs in as soon as possible, because they're going to get us some really nice science and industry combined. So either or of those is going to be kind of a perfectly acceptable first build in our city, right? So science, industry, I'm going to focus on those two things. Probably going to be looking at some of these, like, if I could one turn a sawmill into 232 industry uh, added to my, my current total, like, that sounds pretty good. We can also one turn anything in the city, but that's because this city's doing incredibly well, right? So we go to a slightly smaller city that doesn't have quite the population. Uh, we can start to see, again, food, no problem. We're over pop cap here. Stability's great. Probably going to go into our robotics lab, right, in order to do that, uh, and other districts to be able to do that. The other thing to look at, as I mentioned before, is do we have any, do we have any, like, of the, of the infrastructures that give us plus population slots? We don't have any on research, and it doesn't look like we have any here either under industry, right? But I want to look at industry and science in late game to try to push those two conditions to the maximum. I'm usually going to focus science pretty hard because science is the one that I find more difficult to get to. The projects can be participated on by all of your cities. You can usually get those projects done pretty well at this point in the game if you've been keeping up with your, your infrastructures on the industry side of things to get that, in, that industry number built up as much as you want to. Uh, but that, that industry number... Typically is, is good here, but if you need more, if you're finding it takes you too long to build things, that's where you might want to put in some more maker's quarters. You might want to look at those infrastructures. What's the what's the pop pollution penalty, you know, to those? Uh, is it worth taking? Uh, some of them definitely are. Some of them might not be if it shoots you up way too high in the pollution, you know, tree. So that's just some late game things to think about. I did think of one more early game thing that I did not talk about. Early game build order, I think, is more important than other things because as you go through the game, your style will dictate your build order. And that's the other thing I would encourage is, remember, humankind and the beauty of this game is, I don't think there is one way to do things. And, th and that's why humankind, I think, is has an edge over a lot of other 4X games is, you can really play this game the way you want to. So there might be some strategies that are good ideas, and hopefully I've presented some of those to you, but there are other strategies that are just as viable, and if you play the game differently, you might have a slightly different build order or a slightly different mentality about things, particularly when it comes to mid and late game builds that you might want to be doing some completely different things with. So those are, you know, keep that in mind is that this game is meant to be personalized, and it's one of the strengths that this game has is there's a lot of ways to be really successful in this game, here are some, my, I'm presenting some ways to be successful that I really enjoy playing, but you might have others as well. The other thing I wanted to mention that's kind of more of an early game strategy is uh, prioritize putting in your extractors, right? Get your luxury uh, markets in, uh, get your, your extractors on for your luxury resources. They get you really good things. Now I have a manufactory on this one, so we should probably pick a different one to look at. Uh, let's see if there's one I don't have a manufactory on. There we go. An artisan's quarter. Get your artisan's quarters in. Get your luxury resource extractors up. Get your manufactories if that's something you're going to get. Push manufactories hard. Uh, that's in the tech tree. I talk about that in a lot of my videos. Uh, but artisan's quarters, early game. It's going to get you stability, which is huge. And it's going to get you the FIMS bonus of that particular luxury resource. Also gives you the ability to trade that resource and, and then turn, get more money. 
Um, and so all of those things become important. So definitely prioritize getting those uh, those luxuries uh, exploited, getting those those artisans' quarters online. The other thing to think about uh, is I usually buy those in, to be honest. Uh, and, and again, one of the ways to do that is by using influence. So instead of building them or buying them with money, if you're in a t an unattached territory that you earn, you can spend influence to buy those. I cover that extensively in our Harbor Strat Let's Play series, uh, like, like extensively, extensively. So if you want more tips on using influence to buy in Harbors and Artisan's Quarters, jump over to that series as well. Those are my thoughts on end game build strategy. Again, most of that has stayed relatively the same over time, but hopefully this has given you a, 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 an idea of two years in now, almost, um, that we definitely have some, I, I have even, and hopefully you all have changed your build order, changed your strategy as different DLCs, as expansions have come out, as balance changes have happened across the game, things change. As you learn, to better appreciate different strategies and you get ideas from other people, you might also change your strategies around build order. Thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, more humankind content to come on the channel. Uh, thank you for watching and I'll see you next week.